Welcome to the Minute to Midnight show folks, this is Tony coming to you from New Zealand and with me on the show today I have someone who I've had on the show several times in the past but it's been quite a while so I'm very pleased to invite back Carla Butard to the Minute to Midnight show. Welcome Carla. Thank you, it's good to be back with you Tony. Yes, it has been quite a while since we last did the show but people can always go back through the archives and find we've done quite a few shows in the past and there's some really good ones so I'm sure this will be good as well sure so I'm excited yeah me too it's really nice to be talking to you again so uh, what is the topic um, basically that you are planning on covering today Carla um, I am going to talk about spirits that cause sicknesses, I guess we could say. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, I guess at times there are, well, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, there's at times there are sicknesses that are probably totally caused by demonic uh, things. And then there's probably other times that I guess they just piggyback on existing conditions and and jump in and make them worse. But I notice in the Bible there, that Jesus oftentimes really dealt with spirits when he was dealing with sickness. So yes. um, this will be an interesting topic. I'm, I'm, I'll be all ears. Yeah, I had I'd never really thought about um, or given much thought. I always saw where Jesus cast out devils and he healed people. But then um, I was asked to do a Bible study with a group of women, and there were quite a few different faiths that were attending this Bible study. There were full gospel. There were some uh, ex-Catholics, there were some ex-Baptists, and, you know, just many different doctrinal differences there, and they wanted to learn about healing, and I, I was kind of like, Lord, how do I approach this? Because, you know, really, um, I am very much into spiritual warfare and deliverance, and that was a, a totally new subject for them, and don't even know if they would have received it, actually, but they were interested in healing. And what really occurred to me after one of the women brought it up was I had started going through healings in the Bible that um, involved spirits. You know, Jesus first would cast out the spirit, and then he would heal the people. And all of the ladies there were just like, oh, my goodness, how, how have I never seen this? And I kind of thought to myself, even though I was very familiar with all of the scriptures that I was using, it had not really occurred to me about the spirit being attached to the particular sickness that the person had. So I thought what I would do today is kind of lay a foundation first with some scriptures that kind of work up to this subject. And the first one I want to look at is in 1 John 3, 8. And this is uh, talking about why Jesus came. And it says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I've always loved that because that's, that's what I want to do, too. I want to destroy the works of the devil. So the question is, what are the works of the devil? And over the years, as I have studied healing and different things, um, John 10.10 10 settled it for me. It is written, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. So we see that everything that has to do with stealing from us or being killed in our lives, and it doesn't necessarily mean uh, bodily death, but it could mean um, like the death of a relationship, the death of a marriage, the death of our finances, the death of perhaps the work God's given us to do. There's many types of death that don't involve actually being dead and buried in the ground. So, the thief cometh not, the thief is Satan, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. 
Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have more abundantly. So everything that has to do with life falls under Jesus and God and the Holy Ghost and everything that has to do with death um, has to do with the works of the devil. Acts 10.38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So can we agree that if all those that he healed were either sick with a disease or afflicted in the body somehow, or the mind even. And the scripture makes the point that those who were sick or afflicted were oppressed of the devil. So here we see that these are part of the works of the devil. If being sick or afflicted were from God, would Jesus work against his father by healing them? Many people um, are convinced that their sickness is from God. Okay, so in John 9, 2, we're going to look at some of these situations in the Word. It says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the reason they asked Jesus that question is because they understood generational curses. This, they were implying that, is this a um, inherited sickness? Is it something that his parents did or something that he did that brought this sickness on? And Jesus Jesus, well, and see, doctors and scientists understand that this is a real thing, and that's why when you go to the doctor, they give you a form to fill out, and they have all these diseases on it, and they want you to check off what diseases or afflictions run in your family, because they know that they are generational, and One place that we see the truth of that is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. Talking, And this is talking about reproduction, the seed. Um, whatever is in the seed is what produces the offspring. So it If mom or dad had diabetes, cancer, mental illness, addictions, lawlessness, etc., etc., it will most likely be found in the offspring. And Jesus answered and said about the question that the disciples had asked, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. See, the works of God, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So he was just born blind. It was really no one's fault, but he was just born blind. And why is that? Because we live in a fallen world, and sickness and disease and afflictions are a part of it. In James 1, 16 and 17, Um, It says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, 
neither shadow of turning. So here is the question that leaves me with. If every good and imperfect gift and perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father, then what does that say about every bad and imperfect gift? Where does that come from? Certainly not from the Father, because every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. If Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says that Jesus bore our griefs and carried our sorrows and that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and with his stripes we are healed, then why is there sickness at all? And so we're going to look at some of the cases of sickness. Luke 13, 10 through 13 says, And when he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman which had a, notice, spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. Now, what was the infirmity that this woman had? I mean, we could, we could say that perhaps it was osteoporosis, you know, where the back is so bent. There are other types of arthritis that would cause a person to walk this way. I used to know a, a lady, a girl, and her daddy was absolutely in the shape of a seven. I mean, his head was even with his hips. And that's the way he walked out. I, I mm. couldn't understand how in the world he could drive a car, mm. but he did drive a car, but he was bent over and could not stand up. Um, maybe he had some sort of spinal defect, like I had scoliosis when I was a young girl and had to have a very serious surgery when I was 23, and it was a... Um, a serious operation. I wore a body cast for eight months. Mine wasn't bent forward, but it was bending me to the side and caused me a lot of back pain and trouble. So when I had that surgery, um, after I had the surgery, I was two and a half inches taller when they straightened out my mm -hmm. spine as much as they could. Wow. There's still a curvature there. And I wish I had known about Jesus and healing at that time, but I had just gotten saved, so I didn't even know that that was a possibility. My brother did pray for me and told me that Jesus could take my fear because I was very afraid to have the surgery, and he did take my fear, and I wish now that my brother could have told me that Jesus could heal me because I mean, if I could believe that he could take my fear, I could believe that he could straighten my spine. But anyway, mm. um, I'm yeah, happy so that often I can people, stand up and walk. <laughs> yeah, but people do just trust, have enough faith to trust God for one thing, but not the whole hog, you know, not go the full. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so she, it, the, the word says that she had a spirit of infirmity. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. So he loosed her from that spirit. And then he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So we notice that he dealt with the spirit first and then she was made straight. She was healed. In Mark 9, 17, um, this is a quite a familiar circumstance in the Word. It says, in one of the multitude, there was a group, and it says, in one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Okay. Um, Mark 25, 26, and 27 says, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked 
the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. When Jesus said that, in verse 26, it says, And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead in so much that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. The same story in Matthew 17, 18 says, And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. So we see again that Jesus spoke to and dealt with the spirit that was behind the infirmity, which was a dumb and deaf spirit. And Jesus cast that spirit out of him and the and the child was cured. Now, that is very interesting. Um, we had a case years ago, back in the 90s, early 90s, I was teaching at this church and a woman came in. Well, actually, we had a visiting prophet that was there and he was going to pray for people who needed to be healed. And there was a woman who came up and she could barely walk. She was having so much pain. And so as she was walking up to the man, he prayed for her to be healed. And he said, now do something you couldn't do before. Well, my goodness. I mean, you could tell immediately she was able to move freely with no pain and everything. She happily went back to the pew and and, you know, we were all rejoicing that she had been healed. Well, she came back several weeks later, and the man wasn't there, of course, but I was there, and and she's all in pain and can hardly move again. And this is before I knew anything about spirits or demons. And I, I, I prayed for her again, but nothing happened. Well, my husband... um. Well, I was beginning to learn about spirits, but I didn't actually bind the spirit or cast it out of her. But my husband, I'd been talking at home about these things, and my husband said, I don't know if this is correct. He said, but I have an, I have an idea. He said, it's kind of like when she was there and the man was there, she approaches him he prays for her to be healed, and and she is seemingly healed. But then she leaves, and she comes back the same way. He said it's almost like the spirits, like we talk about spirits of infirmity. He said it's almost like those demons had her all crippled up. But when she approached the man, it's like the demon said, let her go, let her go, so that the man, um, without dealing with the spirit of infirmity that was causing her to be all crippled up, even when he prayed for her, she seemed healed. But he said, it's like the demons are sitting outside in a tree. And then when she left, they all came back on her. Makes total sense. And I thought, well, that makes yeah. perfect sense. It does. If he had known about spirits or demons and had bound those demons and cast them out of her, then she would be healed and the demons would have lost their house, so to speak, yeah. right? It says that unless you first bind the strong man, you can't destroy the strong man's house. So in a process of learning, I have come to understand things better and deal with them in the way that God has slowly revealed them. Okay, so um, then after that, in Luke 8, 26, um, we're talking about the man with legion. 
it says, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land there, met him out of the city a certain man, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. In verse 29, it says, For he, Jesus, had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. In the same story, in Mark chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Jesus said, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And then that's why the demon basically spoke out and says, what, what have I to do with you, thou son of God, most high Jesus? I beseech thee, torment me not. It says, um, for oftentimes it had caught him and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him saying, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountains. And they besought him. And in Matthew 5, 12, it says, all the devils besought him. Um saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them, that he would suffer them to enter into them. And back in Mark 5, 13, it says, and Jesus forthwith gave them leave. So I, I live in the country and I have seen swine feeding out in a field, you know, they're just, they're grazing like cows. Yeah. They're all out there eating grass, rooting in the ground, and they're very peaceful. And so when this man who had all these demons in him, the demon said, let us go into the swine. And so Jesus said, okay. It says in verse 33, then went the devil's out of the man and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently. Do you see they went from being peaceful to being violent? They ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. So the devils entering into the pigs caused them all to run into the water and die. And it made me think about people who jump off bridges to commit suicide. And I've wondered if they might have been, um, had this spirit of legion in them that caused them to want to kill themselves. So it's just, um, you know, as I read the scripture, a lot of times, questions will come up like that. Yeah, I've I've often wondered about that story and thought, why did the pigs run down and drown themselves? Was it the demons? Because then they've lost their home anyway. If the, you know, if the uh, pigs are dead, then the demons haven't got any pigs to be in. So I thought I've right. wondered, is it the pigs, you know, why did they run off the off the, you know, cliff and drown? I've never quite Well, been. it those demons that caused the man to be insane, actually. I mean, they he lived in the graveyard. He he had no place. He was a wanderer. I've wondered sometimes if some of these spirits of legion are in homeless people because it says that in the different stories, if you read all three of the accounts of this particular story, you'll see that they couldn't keep clothes on him. And I, I hear of people that take their clothes off and act crazy. Yeah. Um, I even heard of a case not long ago that this happened in a church service. It was a, 
um, a mainstream denomination. It wasn't non-denomination or anything. You know, they did not deal with demons. They didn't do deliverance. But somebody jumped up in the middle of a church service and tore off all their clothes. They were naked and, and behaving crazy. And they called the police. Hmm. And I think, you know, where where have we gotten off the right path that Jesus gave us power and authority and the use of his name to cast out devils, but we don't seem to even recognize when it's a devil, you know, and we call the police. When I, I wonder sometimes just what would have happened if someone had said, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. I command you to get out of him in Jesus' name. Just what would have happened? Would he have put his clothes back on and sat down, clothed and in his right mind like this guy did? Yeah, I remember my, now I'd forgotten about it, my daughter, who's a psychologist, I remember her when she was still at university, I remember her saying that there was some woman in the university, in the class that used to do that, that she'd really? rip off her clothes and sit in the class and that they kind of accepted that she had some sort of a condition. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like probably was demonic, you know. Of course. I mean, someone who's in their right mind does not behave that way. Yeah. And so, um, so can we agree? I mean, these are, I just am trying to really – um, provoke some thought and and connect the dots, you know, so that we can be more effective in ministry. And, and you know, you really don't even have to have a ministry. Jesus gave all of us the power to use his name to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover and to cast out devils. He yeah. gave that to all of us, not not some deliverance minister. Yeah. I mean, I don't even call myself that. I'm a believer. And Jesus told us, you know, that those who believe, these signs shall follow after them. Not those who believe and have some kind of a deliverance ministry. No, he meant that to be for all believers. And I wonder, you know, just how different our world would be if that had never been left out of the salvation experience. Mm. So we can agree that it was the unclean spirit of legion that caused this man's condition. Jesus dealt with the spirit, and then the man was healed, sitting clothed and in his right mind. And what was so surprising to me is that when they saw the man in his right mind, they were afraid of him. Mm. Now, I've heard it preached that they weren't afraid of him. They were afraid of Jesus. But, you know, many times we are more comfortable with what we know, what we're used to, what we understand. I mean, anybody who went through that graveyard or anywhere nearby knew that that crazy man was there. Yeah, They were used to him. They couldn't even keep him chained. Because demons have supernatural strength. You know, I see sometimes police say, like there's a domestic um, a domestic dispute, and the policemen go, and it's this little bitty tiny woman, and he's claiming that she beat him up, and he's got all the bruises and stuff to prove yeah. it. But there's, they say there's no way that that little woman could have inflicted all this on him. Oh, yeah, because demons have supernatural strength. Yeah. Mm. That's why he could break the chains, the crazy man in the tomb yeah. that lived in the tombs. He could he could break those chains. And they were more comfortable with the crazy man that they were new and familiar with than they were seeing the crazy man dressed and in his right mind. It was scary to them because they didn't understand it. Okay, in Matthew 8, one through three, it says, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshiped him. And, you know, people sometimes make the point, well, it, it was because he worshiped 
Jesus that Jesus healed. But in truth, when you look up that word in the Greek, uh, the word worship means to put yourself in a posture of submission. Hmm. You know, they weren't raising their hand and worshiping. They came to him in a lowly position to uh, submit themselves unto his authority. Okay, so it says of this leper, there came a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So could we agree that leprosy is an infirmity, a sickness, yet another spirit of infirmity? Because the spirit of infirmity is really the ruler spirit over all infirmities. And above the spirit of infirmity is the spirit of death. That is really the uh, motive or the purpose that Satan wants to um, do. That's what he wants to do is to kill you either altogether. Do you know that the, the definition of the word die, the Hebrew definition, when God told Adam and Eve that the day you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. But we know they didn't drop dead. Yeah. So I looked up the word, and the word die means a slow, gradual diminishing of. Mm. Of what? Of your strength, of your health, of your uh, happiness, of your joy, of your, you know, it's it's a death, but not a dead in the ground buried death. Yeah. It means a slow, gradual diminishing. What else has a slow, gradual diminishing of? When I think about aging, I'm 68 years old now, and you can you can watch. We have a visual example of what happens to people when they get old. There's they slowly, gradually, their strength is slowly, gradually diminishing. Their mental capacities slowly, gradual diminish. And so when I go to pray for someone that is sick, I start with the spirit of death, it, which, which is there because of a curse of death. That's what came on us through what happened in the garden. It all happened in the garden. And, you know, sometimes when I talk about generationally inherited curses, um, I had a, a deacon one time tell me, there, you know what? All of that was dealt with at the cross. It's all under the blood of Jesus. There is no such thing anymore of a generationally inherited curse. And, you know, I know that theoretically Jesus Christ became the curse. He delivered us from the curse of the law. But it also says that um, he died for the sins of the whole world. Does that mean the whole world is saved or even going to be saved? No. You have to appropriate what Jesus Christ has done. But I left that conversation and I, I said, Lord, what would you say to someone who says that? And I heard the Lord say, If there was no such thing as generational curses, there would be no need for anyone to be saved Mm -hmm. because it came with Adam and Eve. Yeah. Yeah, true. And it's still in effect today. 
What about people that um, that basically say, well, I have the, a genetic condition, that, you know, my genes are this way, and so therefore I have this predisposition to this sickness, and they just accept it? Well, okay, so that would fall under, that is mentioned in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. In verse 5, it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So, we it, now he's talking specifically about idolatry, okay? But the truth is, before we were saved, we were in idolatry because basically we were our own God. We chose, we decided, we lived, we did what we wanted to do. And so it says that um, upon the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now we could right there say, oh, well, that leaves me out because I've never hated God. But that word in that usage has to do with loyalty. So those that were not loyal to God, that those iniquities, which means a fault or a bent, something that's not right. Um, and so if it's genetic, it came from that genetic fault was in other generations. And we think just because mom and dad didn't have it, no, it could have been grandma and grandpa, or it could have been their mother and daddy, or their mother and daddy. So you're talking about, like, when you became, when you were conceived, it wasn't just the genes of your mother and father. It's three and four generations back. So that involves... I did the math one time and see, I think it's 60 people on one side. So it'd be 120 people, a gene pool to, for those characteristics to come out of. Um, if you've ever seen the game Plinko on like um, The Price is Right, it, they drop this, it's a board with pegs in it and down at the bottom are different uh, denominations of money. And they drop this big disc and it, it hits all these little pegs and goes to the left and then to the right and then down, 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 and, and it falls into a slot. And that's how it is when we are conceived. We have all these genetic possibilities that are in our genes, in our parents' genes. And when we're conceived, they all fall into a slot. And it determines whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes, curly hair, straight hair, blonde, brown hair. All of these characteristics and genetic makeup is in those genes when we are conceived. They're all set right there in the genetic profile. So, I mean, when you think about it, the scripture that says, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, our bodies are so magnificent. It's a wonder more things don't go wrong with them, you know? It is mm. so intricately developed when you think about all that is involved in eyesight or hearing or um, our our taste buds and the fact that that we can go to sleep at night and our heart doesn't stop beating. I mean, it's just amazing, the human body. So it's the third and the fourth generations. That's where we get our genetic makeup. But what do you tell them? Listen, Jesus is the answer for everything. There is nothing that he did not heal. Nothing. He took every sickness and disease known to man on the cross. He suffered it. In fact, when the reality of that hit me, I was able to have three babies with no pain. 
I'm talking no pain. Now, it was a labor to get the baby out, but I had no pain. Wow. No painful contractions. Wow. No pain when the baby came out. I mean, it was a miracle. But I had had a discussion with the Lord, and I was very excited to be pregnant. I couldn't wait to have this baby until I started thinking about how it was going to come out. And all these movies I've seen, you know, yeah. uh, westerns on TV of these women <laughs> hanging onto the headboard yeah. and screaming yeah. and all this. And I was like, wow, I don't know if I want to have a baby or not. But I was having a conversation one day, and I said to the Lord out loud, I talked to God out loud all the time. I was eight months pregnant, and when I would, because of my back surgery, I had to lay down and rest an hour every day, and that little baby would just be rolling and bumping, and, you know, and I couldn't wait to hold it, and then I thought about the birthing process, and I said, Lord, when I get to heaven, I am going to hunt Eve down, and I'm going to punch her in the nose, (laughs) because it's her fault that I'm having to have all this pain. Because of the curse that was placed on woman, right? (laughs) And God said, really? What would you have done if you had been in Eve's place? And I had to repent immediately because I knew good and well I would have eaten it just like Eve did. Mm. But then I said, well, Lord, well, then what am I supposed to do with all of this pain? I don't want to have all this pain. And I suddenly remembered that it was the curse that was placed on woman. But wait a minute, another scripture, Galatians 3.13, it says he became the curse on our behalf. He became the curse. And so then I thought, well, wait a minute, if he became the curse and we've been made free of the curse, through him, then I don't have to have this pain. It's like Jesus suffered all of the childbirth pains that I was going to have to have, if not for him. And that was so real to me. I, I was so excited. I told everybody I saw, I don't have to have multiplied sorrow in childbirth. And they're like, ha. What? Where have you been? You know. Yeah. But truthfully, that became so real to me that when I had my babies, I remember I was in the hospital, dilated eight centimeters. I'm having contractions, and my husband and I are playing cards <laughs> in the in the waiting room yeah. or in the delivery room, and um, and the nurse came in and said, "Well, aren't you having any pains?" And I said, no, I mean, my stomach gets real hard, but it doesn't hurt. And they just couldn't believe it. Mm. And even after the baby was born, I mean, all the other mothers that were in the ward with me, when they would walk down to the nursery, it's like they're pulling the bed behind them. (laughs) You know, they could barely walk. And I just walk like a normal person. Mm. And they couldn't believe it. I didn't have any stretch marks. I did not have one day of uh, morning sickness. I mean, my pregnancies were a breeze. Wow. I'd rather have a baby than go to the dentist, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) But, But I'm just telling you that, you know, the word of God, and, and he showed me this not long ago, because I, I used to say the power of God's word, the power of God's word. And one day in Hebrews chapter one, verse three, it talks about how God upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, that's mm-hmm. totally different. It's the word of his power. So the scripture is not only the word of God, but it is the word of his power. And so as we take the word of God into ourselves, it should transform us because of the power of it. 
What about people then that just accept, you know, I've got this genetic condition and and um, and they're kind of comfortable with it. They just want to deal with the condition, you know, like whatever it is and, you know, take the medications and all of that and uh, that are not really interested in hearing that there could be demonic influence on it or that or whatever. Do you think that the demonic forces deliberately try and stay hidden in those kind of situations? They deliberately what? Try to stay hidden so they're not discovered and cast out. Oh, absolutely. And not only that, but even because of error. I mean, um, a lot of people are taught that their sickness is from God. It's there to teach you something. And, oh, let's not forget about his grace is sufficient, which never meant he's going to help you live with it. Yeah. His grace, that the grace that he poured out on the cross of Calvary is sufficient to meet every need you will ever experience. That is the grace. And I would say to a person like that, well, listen, you know, as I read the scripture, it says that Jesus healed them all. It's He never left any, he didn't pray for somebody and leave them almost fixed. Mm. No, no, no. Jesus healed them, whatever the situation was. And I would ask them, you know, I would ask them the same thing that Jesus said to the man laying at the pool of Bethesda. Would you be made whole? He's asking that man who had been afflicted for 38 years. Do you want to be made whole? And what did the man say? Yes, but, but you know, they had this tradition um, a belief that when the water was troubled, the first person that stepped in got healed. And you know what God showed me about that, Tony? I get a lot of flack from this. That, you know, over the years, there have been situations like where a statue of Mary started bleeding from the eyes yeah. or something, and people would swarm to that yeah. that wonder you yeah. know it's a sign and a wonder and they would flock to it and people get healed what is that god showed me that that pool what happened at that pool was nothing more than witchcraft now it says it that it was believed that when the angel troubled the water but it doesn't say what kind of angel yeah, exactly And maybe some of the other interpretations of Bibles, because one girl said to me, it says an angel of the Lord. And I said, well, I don't know what uh, interpretation of Bible that you're reading from, but the King James Bible just says angel. Yeah. It does not say an angel of the Lord. Yeah. And does that sound like a work of God, would Jesus ever say, the first one that comes up and touches me gets healed and all the rest of you are left Mm. out in the cold? No, it doesn't. No. No. That was a superstition. And I'll tell you what, whatever a person believes, you know, even medicine has proved that. They give them a placebo or a sugar pill or they They give one group the real medicine and another group a placebo, which means it's not medicine. And they will have some people that have the same great results as the people who got the real medicine because the mind is a very powerful thing. It says that whatsoever a man thinketh, so is he. So, again, This person who has a genetic fault and are on medications, they're comfortable with it. 
they're comfortable with it. The man that was laying by the pool of Bethesda is waiting for someone to drag him down to the water, and he's talking to the healer. Hmm. The great physician. And thankfully, he was healed. He received from Jesus what Jesus had for him. So, you know, if a person doesn't want it, then they won't have it. They won't have the healing if if they're and, and I'll tell you something else. There there has become a tradition in our country, maybe not only our country, but I say this time and time again about Christians. We are just like the Israelites. The Israelites, the Hebrews, they went right up to the land of milk and honey, but they were not able to enter in because of their unbelief. Right? Yeah. Only Joshua and Caleb got to go in, and those that were under the age of 20, those that were 20 years and older, perished in the wilderness with their parents. So we, we have gone right up to the cross of Calvary. We have received salvation, but we never entered into the fullness of what the cross means. It not only means salvation, it means healing, and it means deliverance, life eternal. Totally. It's so totally. it's sad. Yeah. It, it so is, what yeah. it is, what, what else does it say? The traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. So see the tradition, we, we go to God with spiritual things. We go to the doctor for our physical needs. We go to the bank for our financial needs. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We'll go to church on Sunday with a sore throat and go home and call the doctor on Monday. What is that? Do you know Hezekiah? Remember the staff? That that was given to Moses with the brazen the brass serpent yeah. on it. When God had released those serpents, and anybody who got bitten by one of those fiery serpents, all they had to do was look upon that staff that was given to Moses, and they would be healed, right? Yeah. Later, that staff, Hezekiah destroyed it it says because the children of israel had begun to burn incense to it mm. they had begun to worship the the provision that god gave gave instead of god yeah which is what we do we worship medicine it, that's that's become a provision instead of God. God is our healer. Well, Jesus never once in the Bible sent people off to a doctor. He no. healed them himself. In fact, I love the book of Luke because Luke was a physician. Yeah. Don't you know? And he was a follower of Jesus. <laughs> and you know that the woman with the issue of blood? Yeah. The woman with the issue of blood came to Jesus. And I bet she had been to every doctor in the area, mm. every physician, and none of them. It said she had spent all her money going to physicians and grew only worse. I bet you anything, Luke had a visit from her at one time or another. And he knew she was a lost cause. But here she comes, crawling up to Jesus. I bet he was excited to see what was going to happen. And she touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed. Yeah, I've never seen, like you said, Jesus never came up to a situation and turned around and said, 
Luke. Hey, Luke. I could use your expertise here. Yeah. Yeah. No. Jesus showed Luke a more excellent way, it says in the scripture. Not specifically to Luke, but Jesus showed us a more excellent way. And it was himself. Jesus is the gift to us of healing, salvation, deliverance. And then, of course, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall you do also. So when we pray for people, you know, he told us to heal the sick, not not pray for them. Heal, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, not ostracize them. <laughs> you know, raise the dead and cast out devils. And I mean, you, it's not rocket science either. It's in the name of Jesus. I'm going to tell you another scripture I get a lot of flack for talking about. The word says, or Jesus said, um, let's see, how is it worded? Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And they shall say, but Lord, we haven't we we've healed people we've we've done many mighty works we've prophesied in your name we've cast out devils in your name and he said depart from me you workers of iniquity that threw me for a loop i said lord how is it if they if you didn't even know them if they didn't belong to you how is it that they cast out devils how is it that they healed and and prophesied in your name how how is it that those things happened and he said it had nothing to do with the people i honor my name so even unbelievers using the name of jesus can cast out devils because it's Jesus. It's not them. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, have, we have Jesus on the inside of us. Those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Born again. Jesus lives inside of us. And we have been given so much power in fact Luke 10:19 says that he has given us power over all the power of the enemy that nothing by any means should harm us so why would we hesitate to use it yeah well that's true well um Carla I guess we'll have to look to wrap up I would love you to pray though um you know for those I listening. definitely I definitely would love to pray. That would be awesome. Okay. Well, Father, Father, we just thank you, first of all, that we have the opportunity to still come together. I I thank you for Tony and the program, A Minute to Midnight, where we can still say the name of Jesus and not be persecuted. I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to do that, but I thank you for that now. I thank you for each person that will hear this message. Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts. Uh, Lord, if it's something that they are not quite sure of, that they will put it on the shelf, and I ask you to speak to them about these things. And we thank you, Father, for the shed and resurrected blood of your son, Jesus Christ, who on the cross suffered all our sicknesses, diseases, all our afflictions, so we wouldn't have to. We thank you that you made a show of all the demons and you gave us power over all the power of the enemy that nothing would harm us. And we thank you that you came to destroy the works of the devil 
and then gave us the same power and authority to do the same in your name. And as it is written in John 14, 12, verily, verily, you said, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and even greater. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I bind and break the power first of the spirit of death. I break the curse of death off your people. I bind and break the power of the ruler spirit of infirmity, the spirit of death. I command it to get out of your people now. I I bind and break the power of the spirit of infirmity, the ruler spirit over all sicknesses and afflictions. And in the name of Jesus, I command them to get out of your people right now. In the name of Jesus, I break generationally inherited curses of infirmity, even those genetic things that Tony talked about a while ago. All incurable diseases go in the name of Jesus. All blood diseases go in the name of Jesus. All bone diseases, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. All diseases of the internal organs, I command you to go. Get out of God's people in Jesus' name. All emotional diseases, go in the name of Jesus. All deaf and dumb spirits, go in the name of Jesus. All spirits of legion, go. I command you to get out in the name of Jesus. All spirits of infirmity having to do with aging, go in the name of Jesus. All afflictions from arrested development, go in the name of Jesus. I command them to get out, leave God's people now. I speak death to every cancer in the name of Jesus. I speak destruction to all cysts and tumors in the name of Jesus. And I apply the shed and resurrected blood of Jesus to each person that is listening, their entire body, their souls, their spirits, their mind, emotions, recreating any cells that were damaged. I speak a reversal to any damage that was done by strokes or any other affliction. Um, all tissues and organs. I speak restoration to the body you created when they were formed in their mother's womb. I see the blood of Jesus Christ blasting through tumors, cysts, masses, known and unknown. You may not even know you have it. We blast those things right now in Jesus' name. Sickness and disease, you've got to go. In the name of Jesus, you are defeated and according to God's word, by his stripes, by the stripes that Jesus Christ took for us. Lord Jesus, when you took each of our place on the cross of crucifixion, you made it possible for our family trees to be simplified to God the Father, eliminating all inherited diseases that would be passed down by our earthly heritage. I speak health, wholeness, peace, and strength to the body of Christ right now in Jesus' name. Satan, in the name of Jesus, we command you to take your hands off of our lives. And now, Lord, we ask that you would reveal yourself to each of us in a way that we've never known you before, that what you accomplished on the cross will become a reality to us and be able to receive it and healing be made manifest in our bodies so that you, Father God, will be glorified and all might know your awesome power. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, that was brilliant. That was a great prayer and a great um, show altogether, Carla. I want to say a huge thank you for coming back on the show, and we'll have to do it again soon. Thank you for having me, Tony. It was a great pleasure. It certainly was for me as well, so thank you. You're welcome. God bless you. God bless you too. 
folks remember to subscribe to us at a minute to midnight.com if you haven't already done so go down the right hand side of the page and enter your email address where it says subscribe to blog a minute to midnight's run 100 percent by donations thank you to everyone that does donate it's very much appreciated and if anyone wants to you can do that at a minute to midnight.com as well and the music used in the shows i've written played and recorded God bless folks um, and God willing we'll be back with another show in a few days time.